to this darkness You're the only right among the wrong You're the only hope among this chaos You are the voice that calls me on Louder than every lie My sword in every fight the truth will chase away the night. Sing, you're the only. Because you're the only answer to this darkness. You're the only right among the wrong. You're the only hope among this chaos. You are the voice that calls me on Louder than every lie My sword in every fight The truth will chase away the night Your name is power over darkness Freedom for the captives Mercy for the broken and the hopeless your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle. Mighty and won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power. Yes, your name is power. I know that is written, hope is certain. I know that the word will never fail I know that in every situation You speak the power to prevail Louder than every lie My sword in every fight The truth will chase away the night Your name is power over darkness Freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle and glory in the struggle. Mighty and won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power. Yes, your name is power. When you speak. When you speak, you scatter darkness, light arrives and heaven opens. Holy Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe the change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. When you speak, you scatter darkness, light arrives and heaven opens. Let the Spirit let us hear it when you speak the church awakens we believe the change is coming holy spirit let us see it. your name is power over darkness freedom for the captives mercy for the broken and the hopeless your name is faithful in the battle Glory in the struggle, mighty it won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power, yes. Your name is power, yes. Your name, your name is power, yes. Your name is power. 
when you speak, you scatter darkness, and light arrives and heaven opens. Holy Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe the change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. When you speak, you scatter darkness. Light arrives and heaven opens. Holy Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, your search awakens. We believe the change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. Your name is power over darkness. Freedom for the captives. Mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle. Mighty, you won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power. Yes, your name is power. Your name is power. Amen, 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 amen. Amen, amen, amen. So I just want to ask how we're doing this. You don't have to answer me. Just um, I think I've asked this lately to people and just say, how are you doing? Because <laughs> I, I know that times we, we just say, ah, oh, I'm doing great. I think. And the reality is we live in these clay pots and they're fractured and they're they're fragile and everything. And so I I just like for us to just take a, a, a moment maybe and just uh, to just lean into Jesus because of our frailties and because he's so infinite. Uh, he's just so amazing and he wants us to in our weaknesses, in our frailties, in our uh, clay pottedness, if that's such a word, that we would pursue the strength that is found in him, that we pursue the presence and the peace and the comfort, the joy, the delight, the safety, you know, the strength, the healing, I just, he's everything. He is absolutely everything. So let's just lean into him. Okay, just take a moment, just in yourself. Just, just lean. God, you are our joy. You are our delight. The victory is found in you. You are amazing. There's no one like you. And you beckon us to come. And you beckon us to delight ourselves in you. We choose that today, God. We choose to delight ourselves in the one who is the source of everything that we need. There's no lack in you. 
you are the all-sufficient one. And we run after you. Our focus is on you. Our delight is in you. You are the target. You are the aim. You are the apex. You are everything that we could ever find that would be fulfilling. You are it all. You are all in all. And we acknowledge that in us, that our lack in our frailty, that you've made up for it all, God. You've made up for it all. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your passion for your church, the, the passion you have for these souls that are in this room right now, God, and that you love us so much that you just said, yes, yeah, come, just come, just come, come. So we come. We pursue you, God. Our faith, our delight, our joy is in you, God. Amen. Let faith arise In spite of what I see, Lord, I believe But help my unbelief, I choose to trust you No matter what I feel, let faith arise Let faith arise for my champion's not dead, he is alive, yes. Oh, and he already knows my every need. And surely he will come and rescue me. Oh, I'm going to sing that part again. Let faith arise. In spite of what I see, Lord, I believe. But help my unbelief, I choose to trust you. No matter what I see, let faith arise. Yes, let faith arise. For my champion's not dead, he is alive. Oh, and he already knows my every need. And surely he will come and rescue me. Yes. God of miracles come. We need your supernatural love to break through. Nothing's impossible. You're the God of miracles. Yes, you are. I lift my eyes Oh, for the battle has been won My God is faithful Oh, in everything Single word he said is true Let's sing a part Let faith arise again Let faith arise And see the kingdom And see the kingdom come I lift my eyes Oh, for the battle has been won My God is faithful 
and every single word he says is true oh nothing impossible to you god oh god of miracles come oh we need your supernatural love to break through nothing's impossible you're the god of miracles oh god of miracles come oh we need your supernatural love to break through nothing's impossible you're the god of miracles shaken my heart is breaking but i'm not broken yet your love is fearless help me to be courageous too oh there is nothing impossible this world is shaking but you cannot be shaken my heart is breaking but i'm not broken yet your love is fearless help me to be courageous too oh there is nothing impossible for the god of miracles come we need your supernatural love to break through nothing's impossible you're the god of miracles Yes, we need your supernatural love to break through. Nothing's impossible. You're the God of miracles. This world is shaking. This world is shaking, but you cannot be shaken. My heart is breaking. But I'm not broken yet. Your love is fearless. Help me to be courageous too. Oh, there is nothing impossible. This world is shaking, but you cannot be shaken. My heart is breaking, but I'm not broken yet. Your love is fearless. Help me to be courageous too oh there is nothing impossible god of miracles come oh we need your supernatural love oh to break through nothing's impossible you're the god of miracles one last time god of miracles God, the miracles come on. We need your supernatural love to break through. Nothing's impossible. You're the God of miracles. The God of miracles. The God of miracles. the God of miracles. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. So this song was very timely this week. We were listening to it just in preparation for today. And I feel like maybe what I experienced is something that many of us are experiencing. And I want to explain my own personal, actually a prayer request to you as well of my faith, needing to be strengthened, my faith needing to be reminded how big God is over circumstances. But I have a coworker who early, I do a tax season job, so even before April 15th, she was diagnosed with lung cancer and I've worked with her for three years. And she hasn't been able to return to work for probably three months. And I've been able to 
physically lay hands on her and pray for her. And of course, I'm reminded every day that she's not there. I'm not transferring calls. I'm not having lunch with her. And I go into her office to check emails or whatnot, and I've turned the pages of that calendar for three months. And every time I do, it just, it breaks my heart. And she was, um, this song I was listening to before work one day, and I just had this burden for her and her family, and I was praying, and we got to work that day and needed to call to ask a question and found out she was in the hospital. And so I'm just asking all of you to pray for Kim, um, for her family, and for her healing. But I feel like all of us, whether it's a physical healing, whether it's need for a job, whether it's loneliness or whatever this season has brought that seems so big. Sometimes I, I'm almost fearful to speak out healing for my friend with lung cancer because my faith feels so small. But this song just brought me back to the truth. And um, even as we were singing it, I was reminding to fix our eyes on him, the author and the finisher of our faith. And I just want to finish strong. I want to finish with a greater measure. And so, Lord, I just want to declare that Amen. over us as your body nationwide, worldwide, mm. an increase of faith. Just give us an increase, Lord, an added measure for this season that we can rise up and believe you for the tough things, the things that we start to doubt. So as we sing it again, for all, if you have a circumstance that your faith has really yeah. been challenged, just speak it out and declare it today and believe that he is going to rewrite the story of our faith and increase that measure. So let faith arise. <laughs> In spite of what I see, Lord, I believe. But help my unbelief, I choose to trust you. No matter what I feel, Lord, let faith arise. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Let faith arise. For my champion's not dead. He is alive. Oh, and he already knows my every need. And surely he will come and rescue me. <laughs> God of miracles come, oh, we need your supernatural love to break through, nothing's impossible, you're the God of miracles, yes you are, yes you are, yes you are, oh God of miracles come, oh, we need your supernatural love to break through nothing's impossible you're the god of miracles yes you are yes you are the god of miracles the god of miracles yes you're the god of miracles oh we stir up our faith in you today Stir up our faith in you. Our faith will arise because you are the all sufficient one. You are the all saving one. You are the healer, the provider, the transformer, God. Oh, our trust is in you, God. Let faith arise and see the kingdom come. And see the kingdom come, I lift my eyes. Oh, for the battle has been won, my God is faithful. And every single word he says is true. Let's sing that part again. Let faith arise and see the kingdom come. Let faith arise. Yeah. And see the kingdom come, I lift my eyes. Oh, for the battle has been won, my God is faithful, and every single word he says is true. Oh, yeah. oh God, a miracles come. Oh, we need your supernatural love oh, to break through. Nothing's impossible. 
communion God is just so amazing it is just so amazing and you'll find out in just a minute but just how he orchestrates communion with worship and Dwayne and I didn't talk at all about what I was going to do communion on but it just segues so well into that song that it just blows my mind how the Holy Spirit is just intertwines everything like only he can so um, at this time, you can come up and get the elements, the, the um, cup and the bread. There's also um, tithes and offering buckets up here to put your tithes and offerings in. It's just another form of worship that we do here at Evangel. So um, get, you can come up and get your elements and then just have a seat and we'll take communion as a family. Draw me close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire no one else will do because nothing else could take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace 
Help me find a way Bring me back to you Draw me close Draw me close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire No one else will do Cause nothing else could take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find the way Bring me back to you I'll sing it together, you're all I want You're all You're all I've ever needed You're all I want Help me know you are near You're all You're all I want All I want, God You're all You're all I want. Help me know you are Check, check. Okay, there we go. So um, just like everybody else in the last seven months, it's just been a real, I'm going to start off with tissues. It's just been a real unsettling, uncertain time. So a couple months ago, the Lord just gave me a, a phrase just running through my mind. And that was the author and finisher of your faith, the author and finisher of your faith. And so I've been kind of clinging on to that as, a, as a, a piece of hope, a piece of encouragement through these times. So then I went in the scripture to find that, to see if it was in there. And you have to go to New Kings James to find it. So if you have your phone, you can do that. Because not all versions have this. Okay. It's Hebrews 12. One through two, I guess. It says, the race of faith. Therefore, we are also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so, so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And it's like, that's it. That's it. And so um, what to just kind of break down this scripture to some degree, it's saying, lay aside the weight that's around you. Focus on me. I endured the cross. I, dis I was despised and, and uh, endured shame. But now I'm sitting on the right hand of the throne of God. And I'm the author and finisher of your faith. So the faith that you had in the very, very beginning is the faith that you're going to have at the very end. Jesus is going to be there everywhere in between that. And that just gave me so much encouragement and hope that God is with us 
way back when we first believed. God is with us now, and God is going to be with us to the end, walking out our faith with us. And that all has to do with these elements that we receive. It's because he died on the cross for our sins. He rose again. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's with us every step of the way. So as I said, Dwayne and Sandy didn't know what I was going to do com for communion. In fact, I'm stepping in for Nina today, who's homesick. But for Sandy to say that phrase, the author and finisher of your faith, and just that song, it just all came together. And it's like the Holy Spirit wants us to know that. I'm with you every step of the way. I'm not abandoning you. I'm with you from the beginning. I'll be with you to the end. And you can have trust and faith and confidence in me. And that's all possible through these elements. So, Jesus, we just take this cracker that represents your broken body that you um, endured for us in remembrance of all that you did. And Lord, we also take the, the juice that represents your blood that was shed for us, that washes us white as snow, so that we don't need to carry around burdens anymore, past sins anymore. We're forgiven and set free in your name. And we um, rejoice with you that you're walking alongside us and with us and to the very end, and we can have faith and confidence in you. You can take your elements. Jeff, I'm glad you're here today. We just want you to know we're standing with you. We've been praying for you and your family, and uh, I know that your dad's loss was a shock. And so we feel like you need even more just because you didn't see it coming, and now you're having to absorb all that. And we hope your family is doing well. You know, we, we just want you to know we love you. Let's just rest for a moment. One of the things this season has forced us to do is try to compress things into small spaces. Try to make a lot happen in a short period of time. Maybe there's somebody sitting right next to you who just needs a hug right now, who just needs you to say, yeah, I'm with you and I love you and I'm not going anywhere. Maybe there's some people that are sitting next to you and feel, you know, even though they're in, they're in a room right now, they feel alone. Holy Spirit, do what you do best. Make us one. Make us one, Holy Spirit. Cause us to be one with you and one with each other. Right now, we just resist the urge to hurry on to whatever it is that's supposed to happen next in our lives. Just realize for a minute, you have no idea what's going to happen five minutes from now. As much as we think we have everything all planned out, we have no idea where we're going to be f even five minutes from now. And the best response to that scenario is, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being with us, for leading and guiding us, and for strengthening us, encouraging us, and giving us hope. Thank you for those 
who are willing to serve and, and to love and to care for people, even right in this room. We love you, Lord Jesus. We really do love you. As Tammy just read out Hebrews 12, let's just turn and shift everything. Go ahead, Dwayne. Shift our attention to Jesus right now. Let incense arise, God. Yeah. Let incense arise, God. The prayers of our heart. Let incense arise, God. Our love for you rise up, Lord. Let incense arise, Jesus. Day and night, night and day, incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Our love for arise. you, Lord, let it rise. Day and night, night and day, let incense rise. Day and night, night and day, yes, God. Yes, Jesus. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. No one but you, Lord, no one. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. You're everything we want. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense You are worthy of it all. Let's just stand before the Lord. <laughs> you are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things, and you deserve the glory. You've captured our heart, Lord. You've captured our hearts. You are worthy of it all. And to you are all things, <laughs> you deserve the glory. Let's day and night one more time, yes. So day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Yes, day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let in since you are worthy of it all. You know, you were created for a time like this. You were you created for this. Of it all. You were created you for Him for such a time as this. For from you are all things. You were born when you were born. To you are all things. For such oh, a time God. as this. You deserve the glory. You deserve all the honor, all the glory, you all the... You are worthy You're worthy of it all, Lord. You're worthy of it all. From you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve glory. Yes, you do. I just want you to know again, Lord, how yes, you do. blessed we are to be yours. How yes, encouraged you we are, especially in these days and this time, to know how much you love us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and our city. Thank you, Lord, what you're doing. Amen. Amen.
a city in Tennessee has threatened to sue him because he's a public health menace. That's got some attention. There's some prayer gatherings that have got some attention. There's, but mostly, I think the church has really been suppressed in a lot of ways as to uh, its influence in the world. I mean, there's a lot of Zoom stuff going on, a lot of online teaching. You can literally go on to YouTube and you can listen to church services from throughout the world. But what's really happened in the body of Christ? What's really happening in our hearts? Are we stronger in the last seven months than we were seven months ago? Are we more confident? Are we more courageous than we were? How are we doing? How are you doing? Uh, the question that Dwayne asked was a good question. How are we doing? How are you doing? How are you feeling? Do you feel like your connection with Jesus is stronger than it was? I mean, we all pray during the good times, Lord, if you just give me more time with you, I'd, I'd spend it. I'd, I'd, I'd be in the word more. I'd be praying more. Have we done that? Has that been your personal experience? You feel kind of battered by everything and that's going on around us. and You feel kind of wounded and weak and you're waiting for something to strengthen you. And How's your hearing? Are you hearing God? Are you, are you dreaming? Are you hoping? Are you envisioning things? I mean, I think a lot of us get our um, perception of how we're doing spiritually from the guy with the mic up in front a lot of times. A lot of times you're doing as well as I'm doing. Right now I'm tired. I'm fatigued. I feel like I don't have the energy that I had before. I feel like um, I, I get this, I feel this real disconnection from the body of evangel in a lot of ways. I feel like I've let people slip through my fingers as far as just being able to love and care for them. I feel uh, some rejection from people who are really serious about not wanting to be in my life anymore. There's a lot of lot going on. I also feel like we're on the cusp of a renewal, a revival. I feel like signs and wonders are about ready to break out all over the earth. So I'm really hopeful that way too. I think that's a diagnosis of schizophrenia. You know, it's like I, all these feelings and all these emotions and all this sifting and wondering and how is this supposed to work and and at the same time, I know that Jesus loves me and that the Holy Spirit is with me. I know that his leadership is real and it's right and it's true. So when he says things like he said to me in Isaiah 62, verse 10, this is what I want you to be. I want you to not just do this. I want you to be this. I want you to be this scripture. Pass through, pass through the gates. Go from old to new. I feel like the Lord has said that to me. Go from old to new. Well, I kind of like the old. And I don't know what the new is going to look like. And believe me, some things, that are, some things are happening right now in our community that if they do trance, if they, if, they do be, if they do play out the way that they seem to be looking like they might play out, are going to change the whole complexion of church in the city. Am I willing to go there? Am I ready to go there? Do I feel strong enough to handle that? Go from old to new. Prepare a new path for the people. This is where it gets dicey because this is where it's not so much about me, but it's about me on behalf of you or you on behalf of me. Me doing something that makes a way for you. Build up. Build up a highway for people to come to me. I don't know. I'm just going to keep doing this. I want to keep at this thing, this Jesus thing. Not church. Gee, I want to keep at this Jesus thing no matter what. But I need you. I need your encouragement. I need, I, I, I need to know that we're together. You know, I, not like I need it because I'm going to fail if I don't have it, but you're more important to me than you realize, I guess is what I'm saying. And I'm probably more important to you than you realize. So we'll just keep doing it. In 2 Timothy... Paul writes to his protege, Timothy, and he says this to him. And this is in the message translation simply because it says it best. 
Repeat these basic essentials over and over to God's people. This is Paul writing to Timothy. He says, repeat these basic essentials over and over to people. Over and over to people. I have to admit that when I think about getting up and speaking publicly, I want to say something that is innovative and inspiring and new and fresh. And Paul's saying over and over, the basics, over and over and over to God's people. Warn them before God against pious. That word pious means making a hypocritical display of your own virtue. Like, this is who I am. Making pious, against pious nitpicking, which chips away at the faith. I love that. Warn them, the people before God, against pious nitpicking. In other words, hypocritical, I say one thing and do another. I say I'm spiritual. I say I love Jesus. I say I'm in this forever. I say I'm going to do all this stuff and then not really doing that. And then picking on people that don't do that. You know, like, oh, I would never. I will never. He's saying that chips away at our faith. It just wears everyone out. I'm going to try to stay away from social media today. But all I can say is, in many ways and in many levels, social media wears everyone out. You may be stronger than I, but it does. It, it just tends to wear all these opinions, all these ideas, all this information tends to wear everyone out. Verse 15, concentrate on doing your best for God. Work you won't be ashamed of. Laying out the, plain, uh, the truth, plain and simple. This is what we're to focus on, doing our best, best for God. Work we won't be ashamed of and laying out the truth Plain and simple. Stay clear of pious talk. That's only talk. Words are, not, words are not mere words, you know. If they're not backed by a godly life, they accumulate as poison in the soul. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Isn't that weird? If our words are not backed by the way we live our life, it's like poison for us. It's, it's almost like if we say that we're holy and we're not, that will actually poison us. If we say we are righteous and we're not, or we're full of faith and we're not, it actually can become poison for us. Our own words can poison us, but it also can poison the body. I've seen congregations, I've seen this congregation be proud of what it's done and who they are. And it's been like poison to us. I've seen this congregation be proud of worship, and worship has got attacked. I've seen this congregation be proud of our prophetic ministry and our prophetic ministry had got decimated because of it. I've seen our words where we say that we are something that we're not and it becomes a real uh, poison for us in our own soul. I think humility has got to be the key to everything that we do. Uh, That's why I like he's worthy of it all. All. He's worthy of it all because it really puts us in our place. So what it says, repeat these basic essentials over and over again. What are the basic essentials? Basically, these three things. It all comes over the under the banner of Jesus saves. That's the big banner over the top of our. That's our message. Our message is Jesus saves. You may not like that. Sounds way too Pentecostal. Way too you know 60s, 70s ish. Sorry, but he did, (laughs) and he does, and he will do that a lot in the days ahead. Jesus is going to save people. Rescue them. Pull them out of a mess that they were in. He's going to do that. And this is what he saves us. This is what Jesus saves mean. He saves us from sin, which is another word for justification. There's another word for that. He saves us from sin. Make no doubt about it. Before you got rescued by Jesus, you were in sin. Not just had a proclivity to sin. You were a sinner. You are You are in that place where every one of us got saved out of sin. Our sin may have been different. Some of our sin may have been a lot more visible. Some of our sin may have been a lot more hidden. On the outside, before I became a Christian, I looked like I was pretty successful. On the inside, I felt pretty empty. When he saved me, 
he saved me from whatever was making me feel empty. He really did. He saved me from that. I felt different. So he saves us from sin. He saves us for something, too. He saves us for righteousness, for right living. And so uh, we're, we're going to talk about this a little bit because it's really important for us to realize that we're not just saved so that we can feel good about the future or feel good about eternity or feel like, you know, we're not going to go to hell. You're not going to go to hell. But what do you do between now and then? Not between now and hell, between now and heaven. What do you do between now and then? What do we do between now and then? How do we live our lives between now and then? We were saved for right living. That's another word for sanctification. And we were saved, and Jesus saves the best for last. I mean, there's something incredible coming, and, and we're even tasting it now. It's not just a promise for eternity, for heaven, but we're even tasting it now. We're getting a taste of it now. What we experienced this week at the, at the Leadership Prayer Summit was a little taste of that. Um, I, at one point at the, at the end, the last session, I was sitting, um, Miranda was here off to my right, and I felt like the Lord said, um, just lay hands on her and pray that the peace of God would fall upon her and it would rule and reign. So I prayed for her, and she started crying, which Miranda does occasionally. And after I finished praying my long try not to be pious prayer, um, as, after I finished praying for her, she l leaned over me and she said, right before you started praying for me, I saw exactly what you prayed. I prayed that the windows of heaven would open and his peace would pour in. And she said she was, right before I laid hands on her, she saw a window in front of her open and God was ministering to her peace. That's pretty cool. I mean, that, if, you're gonna, if you think ministry is important, that's pretty cool ministry. All it was was me hearing the Lord say, just lay hands on her and pray for her. So then she looked up, and Rafina was sitting on the other side of her, and Rafina was like, get over here, get over here. Grabbed her by the neck, <laughs> kind of. And she said, I, wanna, I feel like I'm supposed to pray for you. And Rafina prayed exactly the same thing. Miranda's like, because ah, it's God, because no one knew that. No one could tell that. No one was aware of that. We're seeing heaven come now. We're seeing heaven being demonstrated now. Our relationship with Jesus is going to be like that. I mean, he's going to know our hearts. We're going to know his. He's going to speak to us without words. He's going to lay a hand on us, and we're going to know everything we need to do. We won't even have to say a thing. He's going to be so close to us. And now we're in that place where we're beginning to practice living that way, that right living. So I, I believe that the, the best for last, he saves the best for last, is actually coming now too, to some degree. So we learn and understand and grow in these, same, uh, these plain and simple truths, this whole idea that Jesus saves us from sin for right living, and he saves the best for last. And we do all that in the context of community. Jesus didn't call us to be a perfect example, but a living example. He didn't call us to be perfect. He called us to be alive in him, to let his love move through us. The truth, plain and simple, is that the father wanted a family for himself and a bride for his son, and he sent Jesus to close that deal. And he did. That is a done, that's a done deal. We have been brought into the family of God, and we have been made a bride for his son. Sorry, guys, if that offends you. You're a bride. I'm the bride of Christ. I am the bride of Christ, and so are you. The Bible indicates that the Holy Spirit does a lot of that work inside of us. It's not just you trying to figure out how to live your life in a perfect way, but the Holy Spirit helps you, leads you, and guides you. Jesus, speaking through the Holy Spirit, leads you and guides you into all truth. The scriptures say if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That whole thing up above, Jesus saves, that is accessed by confessing with your mouth, mouth that he's Lord and believing in your heart that he's been raised from the dead, you'll be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. Where do we see justification here? Oh yeah, just, we are saved from sin. That's justification. So uh, it is with your heart that you believe and you're justified. 
You're saved from sin. And it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So, back in the day, when I was a young Christian, we were exposed to a, a move of God called the Vineyard, which is a group of churches that became an association of churches that spread throughout the world. I have a real fondness in my heart for that because that was a time in my life when I was, I was in my uh, formative years. The Lord was creating a functional structure for being a Christian in me. And that group of people was part of that whole process. And especially John Wimber, the leader of that organization. And he used to have this thing that he said was, the way in is the way on. In fact, when his daughter wrote a book about him after he passed away, she named the book, The Way In is the Way On. Christy, Christy Wimber, his daughter, wrote a book just talking about his life and a lot of the quotes from him and things like that. That was such a big part of his life. And what that means is what he was saying when he said the way in is the way on is that you get in by grace and you move forward by grace. You get into this whole thing by grace and you learn to walk as a believer and function as a believer. You do that by grace too. So there's nothing that we do that doesn't include grace. <laughs> he also said this. The good news is that Jesus is praying for us. The bad news is we're going to need it. And everything that he taught was releasing the body of Christ to be ministers of the gospel. To not just talk about what it says in the Bible, but do what it says in the Bible. His big thing was, you know, if, he, if, if I wanted to learn how to jump out of a plane, if I wanted, what do they call that? skydiving. If I wanted to learn how to skydive, I would have to go to a class where they teach you the basics of skydiving. And he's, he, he used to say, I would be so disappointed if I went through that 10-hour class and at the end of it said, oh, we're not going to jump out of planes. You just need to know how to jump out of a plane. Well, some, that's the way he felt about the Bible. It says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Jesus said to do that. And he said, well, I read the book, but when do we do the stuff? When do we do this stuff? When do we actually cast out demons? When do we heal the sick? And so his, his uh, gift to the body of Christ was he gave us permission to do the things in the Bible and not just know the things in the Bible. And I will, I will be forever grateful that those were the, those, that was where my formative years came from is that, experience with God. I don't question about the fact whether people can be demonized and set free from demons. I've seen it. There's no question in my mind that people can be healed. I've seen them healed. And you know how you see people healed? You pray for people who are sick and then watch God heal them. But you got to pray for them to be healed. I mean, sometimes they get healed spontaneously and everybody goes, whoa, what was that? But sometimes you're praying for a sick person and they're sick until you pray for them and they're not sick anymore. Go figure that out. Well, it's in the book. It's in the Bible. It tells you Jesus used to do that stuff. And I think there's going to come a time when we're going to look back and go, that person that was dead is now alive. And I believe it because it says it in the book. But a little trick to praying for raising the dead, you got to pray for dead people. How many of you prayed for last week? I think it's interesting that we are writing notes to the coroner's office. Should you write that? <laughs> oh, by the way, in, in, <laughs> I just want you to know that I'm praying that what this says in the Bible is true. No, I don't know. But I mean, like, what could possibly happen? that would change the whole paradigm of how we see Christianity. Right now, it looks like, you know, a, a kind of an easy entry country club. I mean, it's, you get in and it's comfortable. But you, always, you leave the country club building and then you go home and it's like back to normal again. Then we come in next week. What if, it, what if your belief in Jesus touched every area of your life every single day, every hour of every day? What if it became important what you believe and who you believe? So I, I'm really thankful that John Wimber gave us that. So when Jesus, he would say the way in is the way on, and he would also open the door for us to do ministry. 
which we I always used to thought the think the pastors did that or priests or saints did that or you know somebody that the professionals did ministry when when he said no we can you can all do this I thought yeah let's do this it sure beats sitting in a chair and listening to somebody talk all day long let's pray for people let's see God move let's see worship move people's hearts Let, let's see them fall to the fall to the ground in, in, in worship of God I want to see that kind of stuff but it's really important that we understand that when Jesus addressed his followers, he rarely spoke to them as individuals. We are hyper-individualistic in our walk with Jesus. It's, it's my relationship with God that I'm sharing with you. Well, Jesus, when he looked at it, he said, this is your relationship with me. Our, we, that kind of thing. Um, it was very much a corporate thing when Jesus talked about relationship with him. Um, he wanted them to understand that life was to be lived as a family, deeply rooted in him and unashamedly interdependent in our relationships with each other. So I think that green groups are moving us that direction. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, God decided in advance to adopt us into his family, his own family, by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. I think some of us feel like God saved us and brought us into his family because he had to, because he made some promise to somebody and he can't get out of his promise now. The reality is this brings him a great deal of pleasure that you're here together, that we're together as one today, that we're sharing life with each other. Even for this short period of time, it, it, it brings him great pleasure. In Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, it says this. Don't just pretend to love. This is Paul at his best and most ruthless. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. <laughs> Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what's good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. If we could do that, if that could be right living, if we could live our lives that way in an open and expressible way, it would change everything. And then in 1 John chapter 4, it says this. This is, again, how we're related to each other. God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might live and have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved and sent his son for us to, as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Verse 11 says, Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. How does he get from sending his son because he loved us, to us loving each other. How does that transition happen? You look at that and you think, well, why, John, what are you talking about? He sent his son so that we would love him, so he opened the door for a love. But, he, but that doesn't, what, what does that have to do with loving each other? No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us. Does that mean that if we don't love each other, God doesn't live in us? I don't think so necessarily, but what it does mean is if we love each other, the love of God that's in us gets out. It leaks out to each other. When I saw the picture of Don and Lisa and Mike and Renee mushroom hunting, it looked to me like love. It looked like there was these people who were in raincoats in the middle of the forest that were leaking love on each other. They were just leaking it on each other. They looked like they were, lo they looked like they were having a great time. You could see the love. You could see the love in them. If, if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. That's God leaking out. That's his love leaking out of us. Well, the, kind of the basis for what I want to talk about today, and we're almost finished really, actually, um, is this whole idea that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And the purpose for this is simple. Um, there are people watching us all the time. They're watching to see how we live our lives. Scott, you're nodding your head because you've got a whole family of kids that are watching you. And you're really aware that if you look like an idiot, they're going to think that God's an idiot. It's really weird how that works, how we take responsibility for that. We're really aware that the way that people look at us is the way they're going to see God. I mean, before we talked about it, you may be the only Bible they ever read because they're looking and watching and see what you do. But in this section of Scripture, in 1 Corinthians chapter 
10, it's talking about uh, food. And uh, back in that day, it was a big deal because there was some food that was sacrificed to idols. And apparently they were taking some of that meat and they were using it as food in their meals. And it was causing some people to stumble. A lot of times that's kind of where we are with alcohol right now, alcohol consumption. Because alcoholism played such a huge part in our lives in the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, We have people that are very sensitive to alcohol use. You know, they used to do communion with just wine. (laughs) They didn't mess with grape juice. Grape juice was an afterthought uh, because there was such a struggle with alcoholism in our nation. If you still, if you go to another country, they will, you will, if you take communion, you'll probably receive communion, you'll probably receive wine instead of grape juice. So that's more of a response socially to what's going on in our community. We, try, we actually tried to do it once. It was, it was hard. Uh, but we tried uh, having wine and grape juice and then uh, making it really clear. And finally, we just went back to grape juice because it was just such a hassle. But I heard a, a, a teaching from an Episcopal res, uh, rector, a friend of mine, um, who I walked with really closely, and he was telling me about communion from an Episcopal perspective, and he said, oh, no, the wine is everything. You have to have the right wine. It has to have the right aftertaste. It has to linger. It has to stay in your mouth for like five minutes so you remember this experience. And I'm like, well, that's cool. We should do that. So I went out and bought some port wine. Like you said... Uh, I think I bought not as expensive a port wine as he did uh, because it really tasted rancid. It was really terrible, right? Those of you who were there at the time, it was an experience, all right. Maybe not the best experience in the world, but we, we did that for a while, and I, the whole reason was, well, I'm after that experience. I want it to linger. Well, it lingered, but maybe a little too long because uh, we had a hard time getting Anyway, we went back to grape juice. So they were arguing about this. In, in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, there are some people who are being offended because people are eating the wrong thing. And then there are some people who are just saying, I don't care what anybody says, I'm going to do what I want. And Paul was saying, which is really remarkable, if you read that through that scripture, you, I think you'd be kind of surprised because Paul says, we shouldn't make other people stumble by what we do. But if you're okay with it in your own mind, you should just go ahead and do it. Does that sound like Paul? Paul seems a little more black and white than that. But here he's leaving it up to the people to decide whether somebody's going to stumble, something's going to stumble someone else, or whether it's okay for them to do it just because it's okay. Because I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to say that I believe that we shouldn't do something and then do it anyway when nobody's looking. So if you're okay in your own mind, that's the whole argument that was in 1 Corinthians 10. And then as the Bible, uh, whoever it is that wrote the numbers in the Bible and the chapter separations does so beautifully it was separated exactly the wrong time so this phrase follow me as i follow christ is actually part of chapter 10 where he's talking about that and i'm i'm thinking what are we following paul what is it that we're supposed to follow there you said if it bothers other people don't do it if it's okay for you and it's not going to stumble anybody else then you can do the other the the opposite and paul is saying or yeah paul is saying follow me as i follow christ Apparently, that was something Paul lived out. It wasn't just something he was preaching. And then in in chapter 11, it goes into all kinds of things about how we do worship and where women should sit and whether they should wear head coverings or not and and, uh, whether they should speak in church. And we'll get into the depth of that pretty soon. No way. I'm not going there. That, That was Paul's problem, you know. But... In between those two sections, those uh, chapter 10 and chapter 11, is this phrase, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, some Sunday messages are for specific people. Like I've done messages that are for pretty mature people, <laughs> believe it or not. I've done messages that are, uh, that are a little bit more deeply theological, more, you know, we'll talk about Greek words and Hebrew words, and we'll talk about systems and how things fit together and how things work. And then the people that don't know Jesus very well or haven't known him very long are going, what the heck is he talking about? You know, I talk about the prophetic a lot in a service. And people that aren't prophetic will go, that seems weird to me. Or I'll talk about real basic stuff. And the people that are mature are going, I've already heard that before. Say something new. Or I'll talk about the things that are really on my heart. And they'll say things like, well, that's okay for you, but... I'm in a different place. I, my understanding of what's going on is different. I think that this message today is really for everybody. 
We all need to go back to the basics and understand that there's some things that are really important to repeat and do often. But more importantly than that, we need to understand that it's not just what we believe and what we think and what we know, but it's who we are and how we live our lives, how we act. I mean, these green groups are opening the door for all kinds of blessings and all kinds of messes. The reason why the church doesn't do stuff like this is because people will say, they said this and hurt my feelings. Well, they told me they were going to do this and they didn't do it. You know, the sins of omission are much greater than the sins of commission. I mean, the things that we don't do are more important than the things that we do when we're around people. Uh, most of the complaints I get about me and my personality is what I don't do, not what I do. Well, you never called me. You never said this. You never did this. I walked past you in the hall and you never said hi. I was probably had to go to the bathroom. I don't know. But I mean, like most of the things I get complaints about are the things that we don't do. Rarely do we get complaints about the things that we do. And so we have a tendency to go into situations with expectations of each other. You expect me when I walk down a hall and I see you to stop, say hi, ask how you're doing, and let you talk for 15 minutes. You expect that from me. I'm kidding. That was a joke. No one expects that. Nobody really wants that. <laughs> but, you know, you have expectations when you see me. I'm going to probably not meet those expectations a lot of the times. And I have expectation, expectations of you, too. A lot of my expectations are linked to you showing up in my life, you being in my life. And my, so my, uh, the, the, the things that I miss that I don't see are when I don't see somebody for a while. I... Uh, gave Andrew Piper a call last night, and the minute I heard his voice, it made me miss him. The minute I heard his voice, it was like, oh, Andrew, I, I, just, I just miss you. I miss talking. It, we hadn't had long conversations, long drawn-out conversations, but the ones we had were really important to me. They really touched my heart. I like Andrew. I think he's a cool person, and I miss that. And so... Um, <clears throat> When Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, he's not saying, listen, I know all this stuff. You learn what I know, and so you know it too. That's not what he's saying. When he says, follow me as I follow Christ, he didn't follow Christ. <laughs> Think about it. He was a Pharisee of all Pharisees. He was a, a persecutor of the early church because he felt like that was going to be an honor to God. He was a bad guy when it came. If you were a Christian, an early Christian, Paul was a bad guy. You didn't want to meet him on a dark, in a dark alley. You, want, you were trying to stay as far away from him as you could because he was a dangerous guy. His following Christ meant that he had to lay all that stuff down and be a completely different person. He could no longer be the Pharisee. He had to be the Jesus follower. And it came, it came in a really clear message to him one day as he was trotting down the street on his donkey and got knocked off by Jesus, who said, you're persecuting me, Paul. Stop it. Most of us have never had that kind of an experience where God's changed the direction we're going in our lives, but some of us have had pretty radical swings. We were going one direction, met Jesus, and he took us a completely different direction. Follow me as I follow Christ is not a com command or a rule Paul's giving to the church in Corinth. It's more of a strategy to help people encounter God. When he says, when he's saying, follow me as I follow Christ, it's not about doing what I do. It's about following the path that I'm following, which is my relationship with Jesus is so much more important than what I know. My relationship with Jesus is the key to me loving you and being a support and a strength to you. Paul was a huge support to the early church. They didn't know what to do. They were being persecuted. It was a really difficult time for them. And Paul was a strength to them. And yet he, if you watch some of the movies, is it the, Paul the Apostle of Christ, that one? That where he says, you just need to love. And how... You know, they were wondering whether they should flee Rome because Rome was on fire and the fires were people being hung from poles. These people were scared to death and Paul was saying, love is the most important thing. Just love Christ. Love him with all your heart. 
didn't really answer the question. So when he says, follow me as I follow Christ, he wasn't trying to give them a command to follow him, but he was saying, look at, listen, look at my life. Look at what I've been through. Look at who I am. Look at what I do with the situations I'm in. And what happens when we implement this strategy? We simply end up living lives that are submitted to the Holy Spirit and his empowerment and to Jesus' direction in our lives. If I, I said so many times before, in fact, I, uh, somebody asked me why we taught in the book of Revelation. They were kind of surprised that I'd spent so much time teaching out of Revelation. And I said, it's really simple. And I think it really caught them off guard. I don't think they were expecting this. But it doesn't have anything to do with translating the book of Revelation. It was really simple. It says in the book of Revelation, or at least in the story of Revelation, that in the, in the end times, there are going to be a huge number of believers that fall away from Christ because they don't trust his leadership. They don't believe that he's the leader that he says he is. Because he's doing weird things that are confusing and are putting them in positions of danger. And why would he do that? And if that's what God's like, I don't want to, I don't want to follow him. I want to follow this other being who promises me the world and is ready to deliver it. And Jesus is promising me something very different. And so there was a shift of people, their focus and their attention and belief was taken from Jesus and put on the Antichrist. And I, and I just said, the reason I teach out of, I'm teaching out of Revelation is I don't want the people at Evangel to be in that group. And so I'm not, I'm not teaching out of Revelation to try to create a theological framework for understanding the book of Revelation. There's stuff in there that will help us stay focused on Jesus for the rest of our lives. And that's where, that's where my heart's been uh, ever since we started Evangel is, you know, let's, let's do whatever it's going to take to let Jesus be the focus and strength and, of our lives. Let's, let's do whatever we can to let him lead us and let the Holy Spirit empower us to live right. And I don't have any plan on changing anything. There's some radical shifts that will probably come to the body of Christ, but we're going to stay in that same place of looking to Jesus, Jesus for leadership and looking to the Holy Spirit to empower us to do that thing that he's leading us into. So the other day, October 15th, I read in Jesus Calling, many voices clamor for your attention, enticing you to go their way. And they're all on TV. A few steps away from your true path are these two things, the pit of self-pity and despair and the plateaus of pride and self-will. And immediately what I thought of was build up, build up a highway. Because when you build a highway, what you're da basically doing is creating a flat stretch of road through an area where there are valleys and there are hills. You bring the hills down, you bring the valleys up, so you have a straight path for the highway. That's what building a highway is all about. Bringing down the high places, bringing up the valleys, and so you have a smooth level path for people to walk on. Free of obstruction, no obstacles, just a smooth path for them to walk on. And what I saw here was in the pits, the valleys are self-pity and despair, and we need to bring those up. We need to bring ourselves out of self-pity and despair and hope again in Jesus. And when, we when our hope is in him and not in a vaccine for COVID or, you know, the end of political strife or let's fix the problem, if that's not our hope, if our hope isn't in fixing the problem, we'll, we'll tend to raise things up, the valleys that are low. And there are also areas where we're prideful. And, and you know, there's a lot of reasons why people don't go to church nowadays. Most of, them, most of those reasons have to do with you and I. It isn't because the structure's evil. It's because the people they know that are Christians don't live a life that is enticing or inviting. I mean, they look at your life and my life and they think, I can't relate to these people. I can't even talk to them. All they want to do is quote scripture at me and they think somehow that's going to make me feel better about being part of the club. I mean, that's where we need to bring things down to a level where they can understand. We should be able to talk to them without having to quote scripture, but everything we, can, everything we say is found in scripture. Let me say that again. We should be able to talk to people in a way where we don't quote scripture, but everything that's coming out of our mouth is actually found in scripture. So they can understand it. So that you're really, I mean, Sean, Sean, the prophetic guy. No. Sean Bowles wrote a book called Translating God. 
That's what he was talking about. God has some things to say to people, and he wants to, he wants to use you to translate what God's saying so that people can understand it. Do it in a way that people can understand. And I think that's what, part of the reason why we're in green groups right now is because he's bringing down the high places, raising up the low places, and he's doing it all in the context of this small group of people who are just walking with each other. And yeah, it may not make a big difference after the first session, after the first go around, the first seven weeks. In fact, you may do it two seven-week sessions, and it may not make a whole lot of uh, difference. But I think after the third one, and certainly after the fourth one, you're going to find yourself looking at your relationships with people differently because you're relating in these small groups in a way that, I mean, you've got to learn, you've got to, learn to talk about Jesus in a way that is intelligible for other people. And the way we learn that is with each other. The way I've learned to communicate the gospel and the truth is by teaching every week. I've learned a lot over the years. You should have heard me. I've got cassette tapes in that storage room back there from the first service that we did in 1991. And I'm afraid to go listen to them. <laughs> Very afraid. But I have, I, I'm confident that I've grown since then. But I've grown because my charge has been to, to communicate the truth of the gospel in a way that people can understand. And sometimes I do a good job, sometimes I don't do a good job. Sometimes you'll do a good job and sometimes you won't. But coming up with catchy little Christian phrase, phrases to communicate is not the key to it. Ooh, I'm way over. David Platt, I'm sorry. I'm going to finish now. David Platt said this. The New Testament envisions followers of Jesus living alongside one another for the sake of one another. That's green groups. The Bible portrays the church as a community of Christians who care for one another, love one another, host one another, receive one another, honor one another, serve one another, instruct one another, forgive one another, motivate one another, build up one another, encourage one another, comfort one another, pray for one another, confess sin to one another, esteem one another, edify one another, teach one another, show kindness to one another, give to one another. Rejoice with one another, weep with one another, hurt with one another, and restore one another. That's Bible. That's the Bible. So you want to know what right living is? There's a list of things that describe what right living is. You want to know what's going to happen in green groups? There's a list of things that will happen as we spend time together and do life together. There's a whole list of things there. And then... <laughs> Tammy mentioned this. This was, this was actually, became, this is the focal scripture of what happened this week at the beach. It's Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Okay. Let us strip off. Let us that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up and let us run with the endurance, the race that's set before us. We do this, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who imitates, who initiates and perfects our faith. There's nothing in there that's met, focused on the individual, yet we all take the scripture and say, Jesus has got a race for me to run and I'm gonna keep my eyes fixed on him. But there's no sense that we have a race to run and we need to keep our eyes fixed on him. How do we do that? Paul's, or the writer of Hebrews is saying, this is a we thing, not a me thing. He's saying, this is, a we, this is something we do together. And yet, the easiest thing for us to do is to come in here two hours a week and go out and do we with our coworkers, with our friends, with our families, but we don't do it really with each other. And somehow, outside of a huge persecution or trial of some kind, I mean, you can thank God for COVID because it's causing us to be we. How much fun is it to be by yourself right now? I mean, for some people, it, it is kind of nice to have the time alone. But most of the people I talk to are dying for time with each other. They want relationship with each other. This is causing us, COVID is causing us to hunger for time together. Time with him and time with each other. One more quote from David Platt. Making disciples 
who are followers or apprentices, making disciples of Jesus is the overflow of the delight in being disciples of Jesus. Making disciples, people who follow us as we follow Jesus, is the overflow of the delight of being someone who's following someone. We are following each other. Whether we like it or not, there are people that are looking at you and they want to be like you. Or, more importantly, maybe they're looking at you and they don't want to be like you. But there are people all around us who are watching what we do. If he calls us to build up a highway and we are that highway to make a way for people to get to him, we should have as few obstacles in that path as we can. People should not have to trip over our obstacles to get to Jesus. So the, the mandate for us is creating a smooth path for other people. A big part of that is being able to communicate the gospel in a way that people understand. The gospel is simply the good news that Jesus saves. Being able to communicate that in a way that people understand. So how are we doing? I want to do better. For me, the big challenge is getting outside there and saying what I say here to somebody who's sitting in a coffee shop in a way that they understand, or saying what I say in here to my brother who's outside who listens with different ears. I think we're really close to something really significant in the body of Christ, a real breakthrough. And in some ways, I think that COVID is pushing us towards that because it's causing us to think we instead of me more than ever. It's good news. It really is good news. It's hard but it's good news. Lord, um, we're just, again, we want to say like we started out today, this is about you and not about us, but we are connected to you. And if it's about you, it is about us. We want to be the people you want us to be. We want to delight in you and see the world delight in you. We want to love you with all of our heart and see the world around us love you with all of their heart. We want to be lovers of Jesus. We want it to leak out and spill out everywhere we go. We can't keep doing this, Jesus. We can't keep locking you away so nobody ever sees you or hears you. We need to let you out. I want to let you out. I have a hunger and thirst to let you out. Holy Spirit, if it's grace that got us in, we, we need that grace to move on to. We need the grace to be people who you've called us to be, especially those people who are watching us and want to follow us to you. If we're convinced that we're going to lead people to you, I just want it to be easy for them to get to you through me, Lord. I want it to be easy for people to get to you through me. Amen. A little sober, but I don't know. God is good, right? Bless you guys. I hope you have an amazing day. An amazing day in Jesus.